Sean, if someone were to tell you that filmmaking is a pipe dream, what would you tell them? I've always been a believer in, in and again, my parents have probably uh, get all the credit for this, but you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. So there's many things that can be a pipe dream uh, if you let them be a pipe dream. But if it's really in your core and your soul and your energy to pursue being a filmmaker, uh, I think you have to pursue it. Um, and that's really up to you if, if you are uh, someone who has to express yourself that way. Um, and uh, I, I also come from that mindset, and maybe it's the martial arts, uh, but also family is that never give up, never surrender type of uh, attitude. So for me, uh, I have pursued this business in, a, I think, an interesting way. I, I've done just about every job you can do in filmmaking, uh, from hair and makeup to, <laughs> you know, to stunt coordination. To, to I, I've always been... And I had a mentor early on in this business who told me to diversify or die. And I've really kind of took that to heart. And as long as I was working on a film or television show, I viewed it as, number one, educational uh, to, to the ultimate goal, which is, you know, directing for myself. Um, I viewed it as an education and I was getting to be a part of something that I love, which is telling stories. Uh, so... Um, I think pipe dreams are uh, only limited by your own drive. Um, and so, again, if you don't give up, I believe you can make it. So uh, a lot of the people that I have uh, been lucky enough to collaborate with over the years, uh, the stories are almost the same. It's they didn't give up. And all these overnight successes you you read or hear about, they're usually 10 years, 20 years in the making. Uh, and so it's those people that with that drive that uh, end up having success on a, on a multitude of different levels. How many people were in the town where you grew up? Uh, roughly like... 30 to 50,000 people uh, is, is kind of the population. When I was when I was growing up, it's probably more now. Uh, but it was also a college town. So when college students were in it, it was like double. And did they have a film program there? Or did um, not at the time? I don't know if they have a film. There is a lot of theater. So like uh, my father was a drama professor. He directed two plays a year. He produced Shakespeare in the Park. So there was a lot of arts that way. Um, as far as film goes, I think you can study some film at both Chico State and... Uh, and uh, Butte College, but I don't know if it's a full-blown film program. At least it wasn't when I grew up there. Maybe they do have something like that now. So did you ever drive down or, or fly down from Chico to the LA area and see what it was like here? I did. So I still have family who uh, were down in Southern California, both San Diego, some in, in Los Angeles. So um, I did spend time, and also my grandparents when I was younger, they still lived in Chatsworth. So I spent time there for that, and then uh, also I would come down for summers and visit family. Um, I, I visited my family down in San Diego from probably like 14 through like 20. I would come down every summer and stay with my aunt and uncle. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I was very familiar with Southern California. It wasn't... Uh, uh, it wasn't a culture shock when I moved down here in that way. Um, I, there was other things that, you know, sure, I, I wasn't expecting, but uh, um, I at well, least had some inkling, you know. Well, I think uh, um, moving to uh, L.A. itself, I think I didn't fully grasp what traffic meant. You know, even living in San Diego, there's traffic. But when you live, live in Los Angeles, like really fully understanding Oh, that it's five miles away, but that still means an hour in traffic. You know, like that. <laughs> I think those kinds of things I couldn't prepare for, um, and uh, you know, um, I certainly think what I actually thought was interesting is sometimes Los Angeles might get a bad rap, like oh everybody's so rude or this or that. 
I think I kind of had an opposite experience. I'm like, man, people are actually really nice. And, you know, people say hello to me all the time. And, you know, like, so almost I became a defender of, of Los Angeles in that way. I'm sure that there's rude people everywhere. And especially in traffic, that's when you get the rude people, I think. But, uh, you know, walking around the streets of, of you know, everywhere. I mean, Hollywood to... to to Burbank, to uh, you know the Valley, um, I've met such wonderful people and, and created such great friendships, and so I think there's a lot of uh, uh, misnomer. I think same thing with New York. You hear that you know that New York people might have a chip on their shoulder or something, and, but again, if you go there and experience it and live there, I think you you'll find a lot of great people too. Sure. Well, it seems like too that you can you kind of have a way of fitting into any environment you go in. I get that sense that you you adapt. I guess that's probably true. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I think I am very adaptable, and I try and uh, find common ground with people. And I believe that's probably a a great tool to have if you're going to be a collaborator. So myself as a a director or somebody who's captain, you know, being the captain of that ship, I try and lead through. Uh, that idea of collaboration like we're all working together for the same goal i'm definitely not a it's my way or the highway guy i i do have a strong vision and i do know what i want but i'm open to you know all the different ideas that can make that vision even better than maybe what i was expecting so um uh you know so i'm very open-minded that way and i think that that open-mindedness is what allows me to be adaptable and and fit in and work in different situations and um, I've just found it very useful. I think, obviously, uh, given my parents and family credit, but also the martial arts angle of it, I think uh, the philosophy of martial arts is, is very much that way. Um, studying something called Tai Chi, uh, it is all about accepting energy and redirecting it versus, you know, trying to like, you know, go head on, you know, blunt force, uh, you know, trauma with something. It's more about accepting that energy, redirect. If it's something negative, you can let it just go right by you. Um, if it's something useful, you can accept it and maybe redirect it in, in the way that you're, um, you know, approaching a problem solving uh, situation or, um, you know, being creative. Knowing that you had this quote unquote filmmaking dream and you, you figured you were definitely coming to LA and this was going to be your path. What were the three obstacles, the biggest obstacles that held you back from maybe initially achieving it or from? Um, yeah, okay. I think, <clears throat> think some of the biggest obstacles were maybe just kind of coming from that maybe smaller town mentality. Like it, growing up, becoming a filmmaker didn't even actually seem like a plausible dream, you know? Uh, it just wasn't even something that I really thought about. It's like, oh no, you got to go to college. You got to get your, you know, got to get your uh, associate's degree. You know, like it just seemed like a different path. So as I started, you know, when I made that leap and moved down to Southern California, I didn't go right to LA. And so maybe there was part of that just not, you know, fully believing uh, it is really possible. I think part of me was like, yes, it's possible. And then other parts of me were like, oh, that's just a, you know, how would you even do that? How would you even accomplish that? So I think that that kind of uh, maybe self-doubt is definitely probably one of the bigger obstacles. Um, I think just logistics, like like figuring out what am I going to do when I get there? Like how how are you going to, um, you know, just pay rent? Um, so that's probably some of it. Um, and then, again, education. I think taking those... I took a, uh, some uh, film history classes in, in college um, and that really opened my eyes. And then also having a teacher, I took a creative writing class and then discovered he also taught a script writing class. And so I ended up taking that as well. So I think some of that education also helped um, uh, me decide that yes, I could you know, pursue this in, in, at some level. Um, and sorry, didn't sorry to interrupt, but you no. actually took the same class three times. So the the <laughs> the history of film class that was was taught at San Marcos College uh, down in um, San Diego area was a great class. So I took the first class, and it was Alfred Hitchcock, and so we went through the um, his film history, like from the very first film he did all the way to the last film, 
and uh, we didn't watch every film, but we, you know, from the different eras, we he would pick a film and we'd watch it. And so we broke it down. We studied the techniques, we the different things that they, you know, the filmmaker would like to do, and uh, how they interacted with actors, like the full thing. It was fascinating, and I loved it. And uh, at the uh, end of the semester, I asked him, you know, do you do the same? Filmmaker every time he goes no every semester is different. I go well who are you doing next? He's um, well I'm gonna do uh, Stanley Kubrick. I'm like oh my god I gotta take this class again. So I did. I ended up taking it three times uh, during my time there and studied three different filmmakers. And uh, I didn't get credit at all on the, uh, basically just auditing the class. Um, but I just really wanted to learn about those filmmakers and so I think that was a really great education. Um, and then it was a different teacher for the creative writing and script writing, but. I think after getting that education, uh, probably helped boost my confidence. Uh, and then I met and married my wife, and she was like, "Why are we in San Diego?" And I had done a short film, and she loved it. Uh, she was, uh, you know, uh, rooting in my corner. She's like, "This is amazing! You've got to go." And we put it in some film festivals and did good with it. But, um, but it was really her saying, "You can do all this from San Diego, but, you know, why not?" Go and try, you know, try it up there. And so we did. We moved up there on a whim, and uh, the rest was history. I ended up, I was doing personal training when I first moved uh, to LA to, to pay the bills, um, but I got a job really quickly in uh, in um, uh, production, being a PA and doing all that stuff. No job was ever too small for me. I was never afraid of hard work. I did ex extra work as well, and I would I would bring a a uh, notebook and pen and I would take notes and I would study and try and learn like I viewed it as an opportunity to get on set and see what it's all about learn the terms what do they all mean what's that person's got to be in a mark okay what you know what's minimal focus distance mean I, I literally would would try and learn every aspect of what was going on uh, and again I felt I treated it like I was getting paid to get an education so <clears throat> So I had no problem. I did I did extra work for probably nine months. Ended up getting my SAG card through that, um, uh, and at the same time I was personal training. And then I got the PA job on a TV show. And uh, I self through my own little short films and things like that in commercials. I had taught myself how to edit uh, on on you know on a Mac. Uh, one of the early like uh, iMovie and Final. Cut was first coming out, and the whole Adobe suites were just starting out when I was was doing that. And so I taught myself all the all the different little tools from Photoshop to After Effects, um, uh, you know, to editing. And uh, so I had some of those skills for my own short films. And that PA job I did on a television show, of course, I put on my resume. I can do Final Cut. I can do After Effects. I can do the. <clears throat> and it wasn't even a week into that production when they said hey we saw you do after effects on uh, on your resume and like we were under you know some crazy deadlines do you think you could help with some rotoscoping i'm like oh yeah i've done that before you know so they gave me a couple shots and i did them i turned them in they're like oh this looks really good do you think you could do some more I go sure sure yeah I'll, no problem so i think that attitude of always just being there ready to help ready to work helped me excel uh, through through this business like like wildfire. So one week into being a coffee runner on this TV show, the very next so I stayed and they go, well do you think you can work on a Saturday and help us? No problem, I'll be there. Showed up, helped did did many different things for visual effects, not just rotoscoping. I ended up compositing some pieces. I ended up um, doing some like uh, lighting effects and different things in there. Uh, by that Monday I was uh, a VFX uh, artist on the show. Then one week later, I became the lead green screen uh, effects artist on the show. So just within two weeks, just because I was ready to go, I was willing to put in the work, and um, just having that positive attitude, and also uh, um, like what we first started talking about this, being able to kind of uh, blend in or or fit into any situation. Um, having that flexibility is, I think, what helped me excel, and that happened on other shows as well. Um, I was a assistant stunt coordinator on a show, 
And literally the third day of filming, I ended up becoming the second unit director on that show. Oh, wow. And it literally had to do with, I think perception is also, being perceptive is also a handy tool. Um, I was helping this, the stunt coordinator, helped with casting all the stunt uh, uh, people for this show, and it was an action-oriented show. So we had to choreograph and rehearse and do all these things. And I saw the executive producer pacing on like day two, back and forth, frustrated, and uh, just being, you know, just trying to be a nice guy. Just, hey, are you okay? You know, and he starts telling me <laughs> about how they're, they're not making their days and, oh. and they don't know what to do. And uh, the director's moving too slow. And, and I just threw out there just going, hey, well, you know, the stunt coordinator and myself, we're both directors. And I had actually already directed a feature at that point. And uh, I said, if you gave us a camera, we could, you know, more than uh, likely help you guys film stuff and, and hopefully make your day. I said, whatever scenes you want to give us, whatever pieces you want to give us, I know we could handle it. And the very next day, he showed up with, with a little like skeleton camera crew and said, Sean, all right, you're going to second unit direct this stuff. Which at that point, I got actually a little bit terrified because... I was now going over my boss's head, the stunt coordinator, because like the second unit director is almost the next step up. And so I immediately went to him like, oh my gosh, I told him that you and I are both directors because we have both directed, that us as a team could help. I didn't say that I should be the director, <laughs> oh, no. you know, and, and luckily he's a great friend of mine. I've probably done the most work with him than anybody else in this mm. business. Uh, Noel Vega is his name. A wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, friend and uh, collaborator in this business for me. We, we've probably done over 100 projects together because we've worked on video games together. We've worked on stunt stuff. We, he's been a producer and I've been a director on projects. Uh, tele, entire television series we've done together. So we've really done a lot of stuff over the years. And it, it just he's also one of my mentors and kind of like that big brother uh, in this industry uh, for myself. But so I was mortified in that situation going, I, I by no means was trying to go over your head or try and pass you up. And uh, luckily he was like, I'm so busy as the stunt coordinator. He's like, you go do this, you go do it. And he championed me for that. And, and uh, it worked out well because whatever I shot was good enough for them, I guess. And so then I became the second unit director for the whole series and then ended up fully directing several episodes as the season went on and into season two. But that's an important lesson, it sounds like, because you learned to like go to him so it didn't seem like you were trying to go behind his back. Yes. Because that's a very stereotypical thing that happens in this industry and people do it all the time and yeah, maybe you built this trust. Yeah, they try and step on other people, yeah. 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 I found out, uh, well, at least it's been my experience that loyalty, um, in a positive way, obviously there could, you know, loyalty could, in certain situations, maybe not be a great thing, but sure. uh, most situations is a good thing. But but for myself, my personal experience, loyalty has been a very um, positive uh, tool, um, and I've only grown from those loyalties and those friendships and those you know I've never and I'm just not that person as well. I don't want to ever you know betray or step on somebody to get to get to that next level. I'm much more the person, let's all build ourselves up together. We're stronger as a team. And, you know, I love the whole brat pack and the rat packs and that whole idea. Like, let's make our own film family and, and grow and, uh, and, and uh, uh, do it that way. Uh, versus I'm going to climb to the top and step on whoever I can to get there, you know. I think in some ways it's a slower process, right? Uh, not just stepping on people and getting to the top as fast as you can. Um, but... Obviously, I think it's a more fulfilling way to do it, and I have stayed positive and happy in this business. I've been in it now 20 years um, versus feeling, you know, jaded or <laughs> uh, hate myself for the things that I've done, you know what I mean, uh, type of thing. Can I ask you, what was your first job growing up, like an after-school job? Oh, my gosh. Um, I don't know why it's coming to my, it's like I'm well, seeing like you doing something and I can't totally see what it is, but it sounds I was, like you're busy. Uh, I, yeah, it, you know, I'm one of those people who likes doing a lot of things at once. Like if you give me one task, it's probably way harder for me than if you give me three <laughs> tasks, right? So I think uh, uh, my first job, technically my very first job was teaching martial arts. 
Oh, really? So that's what it was. And uh, kind of. I would, I would teach a class here and there. As a teenager? As a teenager. And then I went and got a job at Taco Bell. Uh-huh. And I worked at Taco Bell because I really wanted to save up for the Honda Civic hatchback. Nice. You know, okay. I was like 15 and a half and I started working at Taco Bell. And my martial arts master, uh, the, 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 the head honcho of the system, the karate, it was a Shorin Ru karate, um, a very, very traditional Okinawan karate. He came through the drive-thru and he saw me there and he's like, why are you working here? And I go, what do you mean why am I working here? I'm, gonna, I'm saving up for this car. And, and he goes, but you could be working at the dojo. And I'm like, I can? He goes, yeah, I'll pay you to teach classes. And like, so I did. So I, I, I oh did work there gosh. for a little while longer, but then I, I went to the, to the uh, school, to the martial arts school, and I taught full time uh, for years and years. And, That's a but cool I did story. have multiple jobs still. I also worked in a stereo store. I also worked at a local uh, baseball, uh, like for the baseball seasons, I would go and work there. So I always liked having a lot of jobs. And, and then I also started directing those commercials at that same period. Um, so yeah, I had like three or four jobs kind of always uh, going on. But, uh, but martial arts, I guess it was, because I did teach some classes, so it's either martial arts or Taco Bell, toss up between the two, but uh, those were the first jobs. What a great story. So he, when you went to give him his order, like he's like, yeah, I'll have the number I two or whatever. I was working the drive through and, right, and then, okay, great. Did you want I had the, sauce I had the little heads, yeah. And then, and then he, you're like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's yeah, him. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. What? Well, that's a great moment right yeah, there. Yeah, it was. It was pretty, uh, it was pretty funny. And, uh, and just the look on his face. He's like, no, come teach at the school, you know? So, but I, you know what? I think working at Taco Bell also taught me a lot of great lessons. And, sure. People skills. Um, yeah. 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 I, it's, it's, uh. Uh, all of those, I think all of those things are important and, and I have kids and I want them to get, you know, they're going to have to earn a car in the same way I did. I had to, I saved up. Now my parents did help me with some, I think they paid for the insurance and stuff like that on the car. But, um, I think there was something so fulfilling about that experience and, and earning something like that. I think it was $2,700 at the time for the car. Wow. And I, that took me, you know, six months at Taco Bell and, in several more months at teaching martial arts to save up for it, but I did. And I just, <clears throat> I loved that car. I mean, that was, you know, because I earned it, you know? It's the first like bigger item that I earned. So, certainly something in the thousands of dollars, you know? I'd bought and I'd, uh, saved up and bought bikes and things like that, but never, um, you know, I think that's a part of that coming of age and you know oh, yeah. all that stuff so what was the first song you blasted through the stereos because did you get your oh stereo from the stereo store of course oh you did of okay. course and i had a really <laughs> big boom in stereo it was ridiculous and what was the absolutely first song? ridiculous oh wait, wait. man did you go down to like a cruise strip around oh, of course of course <laughs> i'm trying to think of what it would have been at the time um I I like know the, smaller towns have that where oh, you like yeah. go in oh, yeah. circles oh yeah, and you they, go especially right, yeah. downtown chico it's definitely a cruise that's you do a loop and, and we would, when I was 16, we would do the loop. We would circle several times and, and uh, thought we were very cool uh, with our ridiculous stereos. Um, it's a rite of passage. Yeah, yeah everybody's kind definitely, of yeah. definitely. <laughs> Felt like uh, an 80s version of American Graffiti. Uh -huh, you know, yeah. it was very much that. Um, which is funny because I've shot several movies in Petaluma. And that's American Graffiti was was shot. Uh, some of it was shot there as well. The whole cruising, the strip was shot in Petaluma. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I I listen to such a variety of music. I also play music, so I play guitar and bass and mess around on the drums and stuff. So I've always have such a respect for music, kind of in all genres. So I honestly, I you know maybe I don't listen to as much country, but there's still a lot of country that I really view as amazingly, you know, uh, artistic and talented people performing it. So I will listen. Or maybe it's, uh, you know, opera. Maybe I, I'm not an opera guy every day on my stereo, but there's some amazing music and such amazing talent that I have respect for it. So um, I'm trying to think of what, oh, that's I mean, everything okay. from Tom Petty to... Oh, nice. Okay. To, uh, it might have been a Tom Petty song. I listened a lot. Great. I lo used to love the Cars back then. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. I played a lot of that, but then I'd play the opposite end of spectrum. I would play, you know, uh, Bob Marley to Zapp and Roger to Frank Zappa to, you know, like I really, <laughs> I really was, uh, I, I kind of have a very broad spectrum of music that I love. Eric Clapton. 
I was like obsessed with Eric Clapton when I was 16. Nice. That's kind of, that's when I was really getting into playing the guitar and stuff was listening to everything he did. Um, so, okay. yeah, probably Tom Petty or something, probably Free Fallen. Right, okay, there probably you go. Probably blasting yeah. and, you know, <laughs> head out the window like Ace Ventura at the time or something. And the arm too. Yeah, you had the arm yeah. Out oh the yeah, yeah, totally, totally, yeah. 